Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Harbor Walk Geology. I'm joined this evening by Scott Kruger of the Friends of the Boston Harbor Walk. My name is Alice Brown, and I am the Chief of Planning and Policy at Boston Harbor Now. We are a nonprofit that is really excited to be the partner of the Friends of the Harbor Walk, which is an all volunteer group that does lots of amazing things that Scott's going to be telling you more about in just a minute. I'm here tonight just to make sure everything is working properly, but I'm also really excited. Scott has said, I'm gonna stay on the video the whole time. And Scott says, if you have questions, you know, just pop them in the Q&A function and I'll be asking them throughout if it's relevant to his presentation. And I don't think he's gonna be getting to it um, momentarily. I will note if you are not super familiar with Zoom, this is a Zoom webinar, which means that we can see who the participants are, but we don't ever see your faces um, or your you know, video or your voice. You're all completely hidden. So we're recording this, but you will not appear in the recording. So you're all safe on that. Uh, you have three functions at the bottom of your screen, um, or at least two. One of them is chat. So you can chat to Scott and me, or you can chat to everybody. And um, the other one is Q&A please, please, please put your questions in the Q and A where it says there's like two little voice boxes at the bottom of your screen. Um, that allows us to track the questions and we can mark when they're answered and we can respond by typing to you. It's, a, it's the easiest way for us to keep track of messages as we go along. So feel free to say hi in the chat or flag technical things, but leave your questions about this talk in the Q and A. And if it's relevant, I'll interrupt Scott and share your ideas. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Scott to tell you all about the amazing geology of Boston Harbor and Harbor Walk. Hi, um, my name is Scott Kruger. For those of you who haven't met me before, um, I'm a geologist, have been almost all my life. Uh, my dad was a geologist. The oldest pictures my mother ever showed me of me have a rock hammer for a scale. So I've been essentially a geologist as long as I can remember. Um, I was a professional geologist until about three years ago when I finally retired. So I'm now a gentleman geologist in Boston. So uh, there's not a lot of outcrop right in the city. So walking around and looking at building stones and the wharfs and such is a, a fascinating thing for me. And so I'll be talking a little bit about some of the interesting things I've seen along the Harbor Walk, uh, looking around Boston. Uh, and I'll jump to the screen if that's okay. And, oops, not that one, that one. Get my screen together here. There we go. Okay, here we are. Um, again, the talk is geology from the Boston Harbor Walk. Um, for the most part, this is going to be similar to a talk I gave that was intended to be a walk, or it was very interactive, where I could walk around and show people rocks and look at things along the Harbor Walk in the Long Wharf, Rose Wharf Aquarium area near the Customs House. Um, it's a talk and walk that I did back in May of last year. Um, we were going to do it again this spring, but unfortunately, obviously, COVID happened. So we, we rejiggered it a little bit to make it an online webinar talk. Um, and at this point, I'll, I'll do my best to make it interesting, even though we can't walk and talk about the rocks in real time. Um, as Alice mentioned, I'm with the Friends of the Boston Harbor Walk, which is a satellite organization of Boston Harbor Now. Um, we have uh, a, an interesting group of volunteers who are, are interested in improving and maintaining and working with the Boston Harbor Walk to make it a resource for everybody. Um, that is that is heavily used and, and appreciated by, by more and more people. Uh, we've been in place since about 2014, so about six years now. Um, and we do three fundamentally important things. The first is the tours, which this would have been if it, if it weren't COVID time. But we do monthly tours and now talks um, that talk about things related to the Harbor Walk. So we'll often have local walks in Dorchester or North End or in the Wharf, Wharf District or South End or wherever. We have a number of, of talks that we do that kind of cover the Harbor Walk in pieces that are reachable by footstep. Um, and those are, those are a big part of what we do. Um, we also work with, um, and this is one of the more long-term goals we have, we work with some of the, uh, some of the owners along the way to design and install interpretive and wayfinding signs that are ways to help people know where they are and what the interesting history and, and 
sites around them are at any given point. If you've walked around the Harbor Walk, you've probably seen some of those signs. They'll have a symbol like the blue symbol in the upper left of the screen. Um, those would be the official signs that we've created and we're creating more and more of them all the time. We have a team that works on those. And then lastly, we do uh, cleanups, uh, particularly along the Harbor Walk, although we sometimes stretch a little further out into other areas when there's a not an obvious thing on the Harbor Walk proper, but we're basically working with people with a 311 service to to try and help keep the Harbor Walk clean and safe and, and enjoyable for everybody. So we're an all volunteer organization. Obviously we always love to have new people join. Uh, more hands, the easier the work. And uh, so feel free to look us up. We have a website. Um, feel free to come and join us if you're at all interested. We'd love to see you. Um, this is a view from, for those of you who haven't been there, from up in the customs tower looking out at Long Wharf on the left and across the aquarium, uh, Indian, India Wharf, and then over to the Rose Wharf would be just off the right side. That is the terrain that I would cover when I did this as an actual walking tour. We'd actually start at Rose Wharf and walk along and just look at all of the rocks and all the buildings and all the various interesting geologic features that you can actually see along the Harbor Walk. And we'd end up at the Customs Tower and look at the Customs Tower itself, which is a phenomenal building that I'll talk briefly about in this talk and some of the buildings around it that have very interesting stones that are used to construct those buildings. But obviously we're doing this virtual, so I'm, I have to modify it a little bit. When you do it as a walk, it makes it real easy because you walk along, you run into something, you talk about that, you interject some things here and there, but mostly the walk dictates the flow. Whereas this time I've had to rejigger it to, to be a little bit more coherent and, and flow in a linear fashion. So this is the first time I presented this, so hopefully I don't stumble too badly. This is the general outline that I intend to follow. Um, I'm gonna start with an overview of the geologic history and in fact, the future that we anticipate of the Boston area. Um, and so that'll start from sort of a large scale, you know, very regional view all the way down, focusing on the Boston Harbor Walk area itself. I'm then gonna mention briefly a couple of actual outcrop exposures that exist along the Harbor Walk. I've, uh, discovered a couple of very interesting ones down in the south end uh, of the Harbor Walk that I'll show you some slides of. And then I'm, the most of the time I'm going to be talking about the history of Boston as influenced by geology. And it turns out that there is an awful lot of geology that has influenced the history of Boston. And I'm going to try and bring it back to the Harbor Walk whenever that's possible. But you can see the sort of list of topics from the harshness of the glacial landscape and how that challenged the early explorers all the way down through some of the, the granite wars when there are granites from different locations that were competing for building stones in Boston. To some of the classic uh, rock and stone combinations that go into buildings. And then we'll talk about how we get to the modern era. So I'll walk you through a whole series of things that are vaguely chronological, but also kind of skipping around to different kinds of rocks that are easily viewable along the Harbor Walk and hopefully give you enough of an insight as to uh, how you would identify some of these common building stones for yourself as you walk along. Okay, so here's the big picture slide. Um, New England, obviously where Boston sits, is a very complicated piece of geology. Um, and I'm gonna start with the two little images down in the lower left. It turns out not many people know it, but Boston actually had a part in the development of plate tectonics, which is sort of the revolution in geologic thinking that occurred during my, my early career. Um, and there's a particular fossil that was found here in Boston that played a big part in that. And it was about a hundred years ago that it was discovered. But if you look at the two fossils, the one on the right is a trilobite that was found in Morocco and the one on the left, which is a print from a newspaper article about the ones that were found in Boston, they're this very unusual trilobite with big long spines coming off of its head. It's a very unique, very, very recognizable uh, species. It was first discovered in England, in a very narrow strip of England and nowhere else in Europe. It was then found in a little coastal strip of Morocco, but nowhere else in Africa. And at that point, people were kind of wondering why on earth is this fossil only found in these tiny little places and nowhere else nearby. And then about a hundred years ago, they discovered yet another locality, this time on the other side of the Atlantic, this time in Boston, when they were digging a railroad, uh, a railroad slot along the coast through Quincy, 
um, they dug through some rocks that had a bunch of these fossils in there examples of it in museums around the world at this point. But now you have three different fossils that are found only locally, but in three very disparate parts of the world. And so they named this thing Paradoxides because it was a paradox as to how you could have these things that seem to be very local, but are spread all over, you know, all the way across the Atlantic and up and down the, the eastern and western seaboards. And so it, it, it literally got the name Paradoxides as a trilobite. And it turns out that that was one of the pieces of evidence that uh, Wegner used back in the 30s to argue that the continents wandered around over time. He, used, he, he developed a continental drift theory. And those kinds of fossil evidences that things on the east side and the west side looked similar were arguments that the continents must have once been together and drifted apart. Um, unfortunately, back then in the 30s, they didn't have the physical understanding of how that could actually happen. And a bunch of physicists kind of kibosh the idea saying there's no way that continents can float around like boats in, in the harder mantle rocks that we know are in between them. But it, in the late 50s and in the early 60s, the plate tectonics revolution kind of revised the way we think about the world. And it turns out that the continents are not what's moving. There are convection currents in the mantle and the continents go along for the ride. And so everything all came together in the plate tectonic concept. And now if you look at the map on the right, you'll see an interesting train of geology where the blue L's and the red G's run along. These are the, the sort of crush zone where two big continents of Gondwana and Laurentia came together and crashed into one another to create the supercontinent of Pangaea. And the L's and the G's represent oceanic rocks. So they're not part of the continents. They're not Laurentian, they're not Gondwanan, but they're oceanic rocks that have fossil affinities for Laurentia, the blue L's, and Gondwana, the, the red G's. And in fact, you can see that the red G string runs right through Massachusetts. And so all of the geology that we look at in the Boston area is part of this oceanic terrain, which we call Avalon. It's the Avalonian terrain or the Avalon terrain, um, which is spread all the way up the East Coast and into Newfoundland now we've discovered it and all the way across the, the Atlantic into, uh, into the UK. And it's now understood that it was in fact a long strip of material that was crushed between the continents when they came together. Um, so that's the kind of framework we're looking at. We, we here in Boston are sitting on a little isolated piece of oceanic crust that had an affinity for the African side of the collision, but got left behind on the North American side when the Atlantic opened up again. Um, so it's a very interesting bit of geology that's local here to Boston. If you focus now in on the Boston area proper, this is a schematic cross section that goes through Boston. And a cross section for those who don't work with such things is a vertical slice of what we think the earth would look like if you cut a, a vertical slice down through Boston. And in this case, running from Southwest toward Northeast across Boston. And it turns out in purple, you can see this Avalon basement terrain. That's the stuff that was the, the red G's in the previous uh, diagram. So that's this crystalline and metamorphic basement terrain that's oceanic in character. Um, there's a sedimentary basin that formed in the middle of it called the Boston Basin for obvious reasons because Boston is right in the middle of it. Um, and that basin is you know, roughly half a billion years old and it has two main elements to it. The first, the lower one, is a coarse grain unit called the Roxbury Conglomerate. And the later one is an upper unit called the Cambridge Slate. And we'll be looking at examples of both of those. You can actually see outcrops of both of those units on the Harbor Walk. Um, another main unit that's gonna come into play in the story of the geology of Boston are these two green things. You'll see to the Southwest, there's a intrusive unit called the Quincy Granite. And to the Northwest is a large complex unit I just call the Cape Ann Granite. It's sometimes labeled the uh, Roxbury or Beverly and other things, but I'm just gonna use the term Cape Ann for simplicity's sake. These were intrusions that came in between about 450 and five, uh, excuse me, 450 and 400 million years ago um, and intruded into the Avalon terrain. And then there's an enormous big gap that's erosional. And the next thing you see on top are very, very young glacial deposits that are literally only a few thousand years old. And that erosional gap is the geologic record of the creation of the Appalachian mountain belt. That's when Avalon crashed into North America 
and then Gondwana crashed in behind it, creating a Himalaya scale mountain range that's now all eroded away or largely eroded away. And what's left at the surface is something that was originally deep in the earth, but has been now been scoured quite a ways down. Probably a couple of miles of material have been stripped off. And a lot of that erosion happened during glacial times, because as we'll see, there was a big thick sheet of ice scraping across New England. But when that ice retreated, it left this thin, thin layer of glacial deposits that I put schematically up on top. So that's the general framework that we're gonna be looking at and talking about through this talk. Scott, as you move on, sure. uh, someone asked what you mean by affinity. Like what do you mean to have an affinity to Gondwana? Okay, the, the, there are continental rocks and rocks that look like sediments that came off the continent. We can identify those. And those are clearly identified as either Gondwana or Laurentia. Um, but then we have rocks that are not continental, they're actually oceanic, but the fossils that they contain, the sediments in those rocks contain fossils that look like the fossils that exist on Laurentia, or they look like the fossils that exist on Gondwana, which are very different. The two continents had very different faunas. And so when I say they have an affinity, it's, it's comparing their fossils. The fossils of the Laurentian oceanic stuff look more like Laurentia and the fossils of Avalon look more like Africa. Thanks. Okay, this is probably the most complicated diagram I'm gonna show, and so I'll take a minute to walk you through this. This is a slice of the geologic map of Massachusetts that was put together back in 1983 um, by the US Geological Survey. If you look, trying to use the same colors, this sort of purpley pink swath that runs down and then below Boston, that's that crystalline, igneous and metamorphic assemblage of the Avalon terrain. That's the, the oceanic island arc that got crushed when it crashed into North America. If you look in this tan color that has the big letters A and B printed over the top of it, that's the Boston Basin. These are the sedimentary rocks that formed in a basement, that a basin that formed within the Avalon terrain. And then if you look down where you see the D, that's the area where that intrusive of the Quincy granite exists, just down in the Blue Hills to the south of Boston. And if you look up to the north, there's a very large area of this greenish stuff, which is a series of intrusive rocks that I will lump together as the Cape Ann granite. And those we'll see a lot as we go through the history of Boston and the building, the building history of Boston. There's a line that runs right along here diagonally where you, all of these sort of darker colors we've just been talking about suddenly turn to a whole bunch of pale pastel colors to the Northwest. All of those things to the Northwest are these Laurentian affinity rocks. So there's a real strong boundary right there that is the separation between rocks that started their life near North America to the Northwest and rocks that started their life near Africa to the Southeast. So that's a major geologic boundary. And you'll notice that I've got letters scattered across the map. And those represent some of the units we're gonna talk about. Starting with A in the Boston Basin, that's the lowermost coarse unit, that's the Roxbury conglomerate. And you can see they have this stippled pattern so you can see how it exists. It turns out that the sediments in the basin are kind of domed over. So the oldest rocks actually pop up in the middle. Um, and you then go to B, which is this younger unit, the Cambridge slate, which exists in the, in the basin. And you can also see that on the south side, but those are the two units that make up the Boston Basin. You then have C and D, which are these granites that we're gonna see over and over again. To the north, the Cape Ann granite is C. To the south, the Quincy granite is D. Those are gonna be very prominently featured in the history of, of building stones in Boston. And then you can see way up to the northwest, there's an oddball that's in that other stuff to the northwest. Um, that's a thing called the Chelmsford granite, which comes into play later in the story. Um, and it's a completely different animal from any of these other things. Uh, I won't spend much time talking about it other than to say that it, it's a very different unit, a very different entity geologically. Um, also, there's gonna be a couple of regional stones that will come into play fairly late in the discussion. There's a thing called the Deer Island granite, which comes from the coast of Maine which comes into play a little bit later in the story. It became a very popular building stone and still is in Boston. And then there's the Portland sandstone, which is the, the famous um, brownstone red sandstone that you see all over Boston. And I'll talk a little bit about that as well, as well as I go through. You'll notice there's a bunch of dots and here's where we actually focus down to the actual Harbor Walk. 
These are actual geologic features that are visible from the Harbor Walk and literally are within a couple of blocks of the Harbor Walk. You can see in terms of actual bedrock exposures where you can actually put your hands on rocks that are in place. There's not a lot of it in the Boston area, but there is some to the south. There's a dot right at Sabin Hill, which is a, a, a mound of Roxbury conglomerate. And then there's a series of outcrops down here by the Baker Chocolate Factory, way down at the very south end of the, of the Harbor Walk, where you can actually see both Roxbury conglomerate and, um, and the, the Cambridge Slate in outcrop. So that gives you kind of a regional picture of where we're at. Um, at this point, these are the outcrops I just referred to. Um, and it gives you a good idea what those rocks in the Boston Basin in fact look like. Um, the one on the left you can see is the Roxbury conglomerate. This is on the hill just above the Baker Chocolate Factory. Um, and you can see it's a, it's a, a, a lithified gravel. It's, you know, pebbles and cobbles of igneous rocks have been all welded together into a, into a single massive unit. Um, and locally, it gets lithified well enough that it can actually be carved up into building stones. We'll see some pictures of that later. But this is what it looks like in outcrop. And then the upper unit in the Boston Basin is this Cambridge Slate. It's just a fine laminated mudstone. It happened later in the evolution of that basin when the water filled in and got quite deep. So the conditions got very quiet water. So you just got passive layers of shale, shale and mud dumping into the basin. But you can actually put your hand on outcrop. So I stuck those in there just to make the point. Most of the rest of the talk will be talking about building stones because that's what you see a lot more of when you walk around the Harbor Walk. But in terms of the glacial exposures that you see, this is now another map with lots of odd colors on it. But if you look at the main map that covers most of the screen, you'll see Boston is right there in the center. You can see Beacon Hill is this sort of greenish blob here. And you see these other greenish blobs that occur in various places. Here's Camp Hill over in East Boston where I live. Um, those are what they call drumlins. They're large hills of glacial gravel, sand and gravel that were left behind when the glaciers were here. They formed underneath the sheet of ice. And when the ice retreated, these, these hills were left behind. These are very large piles of primary glacial deposits that make up the topography of much of the Boston Basin. And then the much of the map you'll notice is this funny brown color. Uh, and it's quite important to understand that. That's actually made land. That's area that was not land, it was water initially. And people have built out the land continuously to get to where the current coastline is. So you can see if you look at Long Wharf, which I've labeled in red here, Long Wharf is way out here, which would have been way out in the middle of the water at the time of the original settlers arrival. This long, long pier used to go this whole way and they've just slowly filled in all the material behind all the way to Atlantic Avenue and a little bit beyond in some cases. Um, but Long Wharf is only a third of its original length. It used to run all the way back to Faneuil Hall um, running down what was then the King's Road, but obviously we didn't like the name King's Road so we changed it to State Street after the Revolutionary War. If you look at the inset map in the lower right, it gives you an idea of the scale on a slightly bigger picture of Boston, of how much of the land that we have in the Boston area is actually made land. It's actually filled in land. In fact, particularly over here in Boston, you'll see these three things, Apple Island, Governor's Island, and Bird Island. Those aren't actually there anymore. Those gravel hills were actually plowed in to make the land that makes up the Logan Airport, which is this big light green area right here. So you can see the tremendous amount of land that's been added. And you can imagine with the Harbor Walk being right along the water's edge, there's not a lot of places where you aren't on made land. So a few places like Castle Island where you can walk on a drumlin. There's a few places where you can get within a few blocks of outcrops. But through most of the length of the Harbor Walk, you're walking on made land. And so it's difficult to see actual geology um, except for these glacial hills that you can see looking in both directions. Um, I think that's it for that slide. Um, that's going to come in very, very important to realize how much of that land is there because all of that land is sitting about 10 feet or so above mean high tide. And so that means it's, it's going to be a challenge as sea level starts to rise as most of our climate models predict. And here's a, a graph that's going to make that point quite emphatically. This diagram, which is from Glenn Fergus on Wikimedia Commons, uh, 
looks at the temperature through time of the last 60 million years. And this is a bit, it takes a minute to sort of explain this plot. There are four different panels that are four very different time scales. Um, the first one on the left with the green lines, you can see these are 10 million year increments. The one with the green, the black lines, that's 1 million year increments. You move to this third panel, you can see they're 200,000 year increments. And when you go to the last line, you can see these increments are only 5,000 years. Obviously the most interesting one is the recent one and it goes to today at the far right side. If you look at how much colder the world was during the last glacial maximum, which is what this LGM stands for, um, that's when the ice sheets were covering much of North America. And there's a little inset map here. You can see about how far that ice sheet came. You can see that Boston was completely covered in ice. The ice went all the way down to Long Island, Martha's Vineyard, Nantucket Island. Those are all glacial deposits at the end of that sheet of ice. And so we know that we were completely buried in ice for a considerable period of time during this uh, last glacial period. And that ice, as the, as the planet warmed back up, that ice retreated and then has been retreating pretty much to today's current situation. And you see from this, we've actually enjoyed a very, very long period of fairly stable temperature of about 12,000 years, uh, which has allowed all of civilization as we know it to blossom and bloom and kind of develop its own stable environment. Things have not been changing terribly dramatically over that long time period. So all of written history that we know about is in that horizontal band of fairly consistent temperatures that run through there. But you can see this little spike of blue right there. That's the change we've made in the last few years, the last hundred years, I should say. Um, we've actually bumped up the temperature of the planet quite considerably. And in fact, it's now warmer than at any time during written history. And probably the only, the, you have to go back 100,000 years to find a time when the earth was hotter than it is today. And so you hear in the news, obviously, about the increasing hurricanes because you're more moisture is coming up into the atmosphere and the increasing fires. That's what we're basically talking about. The planet is warming up. And if you look at climate models, there are predictions, sort of moderate predictions, these aren't even worst case, that predict by 2100, we could actually raise several degrees in terms of the temperature of the atmosphere on, on Earth. And it's all because of the greenhouse gases that we're spewing out in the, the basically uh, burning of fossil fuels, creating of carbon dioxide. Um, but you can imagine if we do follow that path, by 2100, we're gonna be hotter than at any time since before man started walking upright three, over three million years ago. So we're actually doing a very, very dangerous experiment, moving the planet to a condition that we as humans have never experienced before. So it's actually a, a potentially you know, globally catastrophic event if we let climate change get run away. And of course, as the planet warms up, what you'll find is that all of the ice that's left melts and sea level will rise. And as that temperature goes up, all of that made land that you see in Boston, roughly 70% of the central area of Boston, will basically go underwater every time there's a, a, a storm tide. Uh, we had an instance about a year ago when during a king tide, a heavy rain, the wind blowing in, blowing water into the bay, where we had water lapping into areas on the Harbor Walk. I actually went around and filmed some of that in East Boston and there were cars up to their door handles in the water and they had to put sandbags around the entrance to, um, to Aquarium Station because water was starting to flow in and down the escalator. So you can imagine if, if you raised sea level a foot or two or three, those storms are gonna be quite dramatically more damaging and probably a lot more frequent. So it's worth keeping in mind that we, we need to take global climate change seriously or we could be in a world of hurt given our current situation. Okay, getting back to the geology again, um, this is an estimate of what that global ice sheet looked like. Again, here's the Boston Bay Area as Cape Cod. You can see if you walk around and look at exposed geology around New England, you can see glacial grooves, which tell you which direction the ice was flowing and dragging rocks as it moved along. And you can basically find at right angles, I've drawn these lines of what the approximate thickness must have been to drive that motion um, of the ice. And the end of the ice was way down here. So bits of Long Island and the, the Nantucket Island and, and, and uh, Martha's Vineyard are all 
glacial deposits that exist at the end of that ice sheet. And as it retreated, it just made layer after layer of strand lines, if you will. And Cape Cod is entirely glacial deposits that were forming out at the end of that, uh, that glacial ice sheet. But if you look at it, if you look at present day Greenland or some of the ice sheets around the world, and you project the present day ice slope that's required to move the ice, and you apply that to New England, you can see that that's what these numbers are based on. I just took that typical gradient that you find today and applied it back from the end of the ice that we knew was there. And you can see that Boston was sitting under about a mile of ice. There's obviously a lot of slop in that estimate, but it gives you a ballpark idea of just how much ice was scraping its way across the Boston area. So as a result, you can imagine there's been an awful lot of erosion that's uh, been related to that ice sheet that existed about 20,000 years ago. And as a result, all of the topography that you see in the Boston area, and this is just a digital topographic map, so some of the, some of the low lying areas don't map very well because it's, the zero line isn't terribly well defined, but Boston sits right there. That's, that's Beacon Hill right there. Um, but if you look up to the north, you can see this line of hills where there's lots of topography, lots of sort of angularity and hills. That's those crystalline rocks to the north of Boston. And as soon as you come across this line, that's the big scarp in Arlington. If you go out Route 2, if you drive out that giant hill, that's climbing onto the crystalline rocks from the Boston Basin. Or if you're coming down 93, you drop down off of that highland into the Boston Basin. The Boston Basin is that Cambridge Slate, which was a much softer, much more erodible rock. So the ice was having a hard time eroding the stuff to the north, but as soon as it got, as soon as it got on top of the Cambridge Slate, it scoured away and, and ate its way way down. And so it, it sits quite low relative to the rocks to the north. The Roxbury conglomerate is a little bit less erodible. So you can see it creates some bumpy topography in the center of the Boston Basin. Then you get some more smooth topography with this Cambridge Slate. And then you get into the crystalline rocks to the south. And again, you're in a big, you know, topographic highs like the Blue Hills that are erosional remnants that survived the ice. But there's good evidence from a hike that I took and others have noted this as well in the literature. If you hike up Big Blue, which is a fairly high hill by Boston standards, you can see glacial grooves all the way to within a few hundred feet of the summit. And it, from the directions of those grooves, it looks like the ice was going right over the top. So as big as uh, Big Blue is, it was probably completely buried in ice at the peak glaciation. One of the interesting geologic features you pick up is actually quite visible in this topographic map. You see these little things that look like pumpkin seeds. These are those drumlins I was talking to you about. These are the glacial gravel hills that formed under the ice and got left behind when the ice retreated. And of course, some of the big hills like Beacon Hill and, and the North End and you know the various ones, plus a lot of the harbor islands are all of these drumlins. And if you ever go out and you visit them, you'll see that they just piles of sand and gravel and boulders all kind of tossed together um, that were dragged along in the ice and then fell out either underneath or as it melted back. So very interesting geology. Um, and it just shows up in the topography. It's quite, quite obvious. Um, there's an image, a set of three images in the lower left that I'm going to speak briefly about. Um, and they relate to sea level changes in the past. It turns out and when the ice initially melted away from Boston, as it started to retreat to the north, the weight of that ice being removed caused the land to pop up like a cork out of the mantle. And so it rose up about 120 feet from where it is today. Um, but then as the ice continued to melt, sea level came up to kind of get back to where it was. But that's fairly important. If you look at this very first inset line, that's where the coastline was when the rebound had just happened. It's about 120 feet below modern sea level. And it turns out when the first humans came to North America, that's probably where they lived. A lot of people had wondered for a long, long time why we don't see a lot of evidence of early man in the, the east and west coasts of North America. It turns out they were here, we just didn't know it. They've now discovered that if you go way out here in the water where these sort of salmon-y colors are, there's evidence of human habitation that exists on the shelf out there. They found in um, side scan sonar images, um, fish weirs that were built. These are rings of rocks to capture fish as the tide goes up and down. And there have been dredges that have picked up evidence of, of human 
uh, human materials, you know, carved stones and things, tools and such that had been dredged out in that area. So we know that there were in fact humans living out there um, when the ice was initially retreating. And now unfortunately, almost all of those sites are, are underwater and are very hard to access. And then of course, as the ice melted further and further back, sea level came up and you get basically to where we are today. But that's been stable for about the last 12,000 years as we, as we showed. So um, it's, it's going to be interesting to see what happens as we start to flood what's left. Scott, I'm blown away by that. And I also want to ask a question. Sure, absolutely. Um, on this map, someone asks, is, 90, is the place on 93 where it falls down where the fells start? Is that the same place? Yes, the, the fells are in the crystalline rocks to the north. As you come just south of the fells, when you come off of that hill and you get that beautiful panoramic view of the downtown area on 93, that is the slope coming off of those crystalline rocks into the Boston Basin. So that's the topographic drop when you go from hard rocks that the glacier had a hard time eroding down into the soft rocks that it eroded quite a ways down. Yeah. And I think that the reason that there's an, it's a national park designation for the Harbor Islands is because they are drowned drumlins and they're, that's a very yeah, rare so thing. That's, that's an interesting point. When you look at the literature from the, the Harbor Islands Park, that was one of the criteria they used for deciding that it was a, a natural treasure. It is the only known drowned drumlin field that's, that's actually intersected by the coast. Um, and so that's one of the reasons it was considered a bit of a natural wonder and why they made it into a national park. It is very, very unusual. There are drumlin fields elsewhere in the world, but most of them are either seen on the topography of the seafloor or else they're exposed on land today. Um, this is the only one I know of that's a large drumlin field that has the coastline running right through the middle of it. Um, it's obviously a dynamic situation because the waves are eroding the outer ones. A lot of these outer rocky islands used to be drumlin, but you've eroded all the sand and gravel off the top and left the little spines of outcrop that originally were the reason that the drumlins formed in that location. But if you go to some of these islands, they're very quickly eroding. So even from the time the park was created till today, there's been significant erosion of some of the outer heads of some of those islands. Okay, getting back to the history now. And the, from here on, we're mostly gonna be talking about um, history of Boston and how geology fits into the history of Boston. Um, this is a, a long wordy slide, so I don't want to belabor it too much, but um, interestingly, it goes all the way back to the Vikings. Um, the Vikings, as most people know, were exploring across, they discovered Iceland, they discovered Greenland, and it turns out they got, as far as we can tell, as far as Newfoundland. Um, they were actually, from recent discoveries, they, they've concluded that they were chasing walrus ivory. That's the reason they were going there. They weren't looking for new lands to occupy. They were chasing walrus ivory, which was an extremely valuable commodity back in that time. And apparently in 1400, um, the sudden discovery and introduction of elephant ivory from Africa caused the value of ivory to collapse. And so they couldn't justify the massive sea voyages they were taking to collect walrus ivory. And so they literally abandoned the settlements they had going as far west as Newfoundland and basically retreated back, uh, back home. And so there was a, an absolute stop to European um, motion into North, into North America for about a hundred years. Um, needless to say, the word that there was land out there was no surprise, but Columbus obviously decided he was going to sail around the world. Back then, they, they already knew the world was round. He was going to go around and see if he could reach Asia the long way around. And of course, everyone knows he bumped into North America um, quite a bit south of here, but he did discover the, the, the continent. Um, jump down here. Um, from 1540 to 1613, there were at least a dozen attempts to create colonies because that was the legal way you could claim land was to have a permanent settlement. That was the legal definition of having rights to the land. So there was a land grab as all the different European nations were trying to come over here and grab land. You know, from the time Columbus discovered it, it was a free for all. Um, obviously the first successful ones were Jamestown and New York, which happened in 1607, 1608. And once there was a successful one, it was like the starting gun went off and everybody and their brothers started trying to sail across the sea to make a new life or to make riches in the new world. Um, John Smith mapped the New England coast and named it New England in 1614. Um, it's believed in 1617, a French raiding vessel um, beached itself on Pettix Island here in the, in the harbor. 
And unfortunately, two of the soldier, uh, the sailors on that vessel, they believe had smallpox. And that plague decimated the Indian population that lived here in the, in the Boston area. Um, everybody knows the story of the pilgrims in 1620. Um, they were a bit more hapless than the story typically leads. They were trying to get to New York, which was an established colony, and they missed, and they hit the tip of Cape Cod right up here. Um, they tried to make the best of it, but they discovered very quickly that in a little spit like that made of very porous glacial soil, there was no fresh water to be had by digging for it because it was all salt water. The ocean, the ocean just seeped through the sediments and, and there was no fresh water to be had. So they abandoned that site and quickly cruised over to Plymouth, which is where they made their permanent settlement. Um, in 1628, just a few years later, a hundred people came across with John Endicott and settled at Salem. That was the second major occupation in the area. And then the big one happened around um, 1630 when John Winthrop came across. He decided he was going to bring a thousand settlers and he was going to settle them in Salem. But when they got to Salem quite successfully, the people in Salem were like, we can't handle a thousand people. There's no way you could stay here. So they moved down to Charlestown. And they found that there was no really good drinking water in Charlestown. So they eventually moved across to Boston, to the Shawmut Peninsula, where it turns out there were 13 freshwater springs that made it much easier to survive there. And so the Shawmut Peninsula became sort of ground zero for settlement for the, the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And it's been Boston ever since. It's kind of the central hub of New England um, since that time. But it was largely geology that ended up causing Boston to be that site, as opposed to something like Salem or Plymouth. And the reason for that, if you look at Boston, there's plenty of, of advantages that Boston had. Um, it's obviously a very sheltered harbor. We talked about all the harbor islands. They create the worst, they block the worst of the winter storms that come raging in. So if you're in here in Boston, you're very sheltered from all of the, the, the damage that could come from the ocean waves coming in. As I mentioned, there were natural springs. They had some, in, they had a good one in East Boston where Samuel Maverick settled. They had 13 of them they found on, on the Shawmut Peninsula and that's where they ended up settling the city. Um, there were tremendous amounts of mud flats for digging clams. There were marshes to collect fish and birds. So they had no shortage of, of um, food to eat. There were abundant hardwood forests in the vicinity so they could make all of the, the buildings and firewood they wanted. So that was, that was there. It turns out also there was clay and cobbles. There's beautiful brick clay that you could find in abundance that the glaciers had created and left behind. So there's a geologic material that was uh, a bonus for the Boston area. And they were just to the north and south, there are very rocky beaches where you could collect cobbles that you could use for cobblestone streets so that you didn't have dusty thoroughfares for your wagons. Uh, in some of the interior uh, valleys, there was beautiful farmland. And I say relatively friendly natives because that's a, a questionable term. Basically, there were almost no natives left. It's estimated there were between 500 and 1,000 Native Americans living in the greater Boston area um, before the plague hit and over 90% of them were killed by the plague. And so by the time the settlers arrived, there were actually abandoned farm fields and abandoned structures that a lot of the early settlers just moved right into. Um, so it actually created an, a natural haven for them um, to just move in and settle in and use those cl cleared fields to, to plant their own crops. So it wasn't so much that the natives were friendly as that they were kind of decimated and couldn't put up any resistance. So Boston became the site and Boston, as, as you know, is why we're here. So starting to look more at rocks from here on through the talk. Um, the slide on the left, I'm going to walk through these systematically. We're talking about cobblestones. That's one of the earliest uses of stone that you'll see in the Boston area. Early on, they literally were cobbles. They were just beach cobbles. Um, if you go all the way back to some of the earliest cobblestone streets, those cobbles actually weren't local. They were ballast from ships that came over empty, dumped their ballast, picked up cargo, and those ballast rocks that were dumped on the, on the wharf, people would pick up and use to build roads with. Subsequently, they discovered they had plenty of their own cobbles locally. So cobble, cobblestone streets became very common um, as a way to keep from getting rutted and, and dusty streets. So that was a very popular thing early on, very popular early use of stone. As they started to discover the granite resources nearby and to quarry them, they started making paving blocks out of granite 
And so this is a much more common thing you'll get through much of the 1800s are these carved rectangular blocks that were incredibly sturdy, but you can see you know, decades of cart path um, even indented some of those. This is one in East Boston that actually leads down to the Harbor Walk in East Boston. It's a beautiful, beautiful old street that's been preserved from the 1800s. And of course, if you go to the modern times, a lot of the pedestrian areas in historic Boston are now paved with paving stones and paving bricks of various kinds. So there's lots of interesting geology to look at in the stones underfoot. Going back to the beginning, I mentioned there was incredible amounts of wood available for building houses and using firewood and such. But unfortunately, when you build a dense packed city full of wooden structures, you're very prone to fires. And every decade or so, there'd be a pretty large fire in the city of Boston, and people got a little tired of that. And then there's a huge one in the late 1690s that basically decimated the entire downtown area and burned several of the wharves, which at that time were built out of wood. And so they actually passed laws to encourage using brick and stone in buildings instead of wood. Um, unfortunately, from the accounts that are, are relevant at the time, it was largely ignored, the law that they passed. So Boston was starting on a long tradition of ignoring zoning codes by continuing to build wooden structures, even after it wasn't legal anymore, theoretically. Um, and of course, the, the wharves that were wood that burned, they decided to replace with stone, which was a lot sturdier and not, not subject to those occasional fires. Um, then a major event happened in 1755. There was an enormous earthquake, by local standards anyway, that happened up at Cape Ann. Um, and the shaking was so great that it actually knocked down tremendous numbers of poorly constructed brick buildings. And so there was kind of a recognition that the stone buildings, which survived better, were actually a better, uh, better building material than, than the brick. And so there was this huge wave toward using stone and granite, the local granites, um, that caused uh, a, a complete change in the way people viewed buildings and, and what to be, make buildings out of. And at about that time, right around 1800, there were advances in quarrying tools and quarrying methods and improvements in transportation that we'll talk about a little bit that ushered in what I like to call the granite age. And the next little bit will be talking about granites from around Boston and how they all came into play on the history of Boston. I want to flag, we've got about 15 minutes left. Okay, that's good. Um, here's a slide talking about wharves and seawalls. I mean, you see the slide on the right is a historic image of Long Wharf. Probably, as best I can tell from its time, it was probably taken from the roof of the initial customs building before they put the tower on top. But you can see it was a maritime area. The wharves were a huge part of the economy of Boston, still are. And so when they burned down, they decided that they weren't going to keep rebuilding them. They were going to build them out of stone. And here's a classic example that I, a picture I took at India Wharf, where you can actually see generation upon generation of rebuilding that's been done of these wharfs. The older stone at the bottom are relatively rough blocks. There's an intermediate layer that's much better preserved. And clearly, I'll, I'll point out why we can tell based on some of the tool marks that you see, are quite a bit younger than these older blocks that are at the bottom. And then these beautifully sawn modern blocks are, are completely different generations. So you can see a sort of stratigraphy of building and rebuilding that happens on a lot of these wharfs. Uh, and you could obviously argue that the perhaps the older, the older building was a little more careful than the younger one, because this is not exactly the best, uh, the best job that was done in putting the most recent additions onto that wharf. Granite became a huge part of Boston. Um, when you go down to Quincy, you'll still see occasionally places where they haven't cleaned up all the boulders on the surface. This is what the outcrops looked like before they started picking them all up. What they would do when they wanted stone, they'd have an idea of the size they wanted and they'd just go out in the field and find one that's about the right size that they could carve down and square off with hammer and chisel. And then they'd, they'd haul it back and, and they'd build stone walls out of it. So if you look down at the bottom, this is an example of one of those what they call field stone walls. The blocks are sort of irregular. They're not consistent size. So it was actually a whole industry to have uh, the, the artistry skills to stack these things in useful ways that actually ended up having a horizontal top on them. So you can see these very irregular patterns that get made with these irregular blocks from field stone granite. Those are the oldest style that you'll see. Around 1800, there were imported tools that came from Europe. 
these feather and wedge tools, the little metal slides that that sit in the that they drill a series of holes. You put these little slides in, and then there's a wedge that goes in between the two metal pieces, and it creates lateral pressure that opens up cracks in the granite. And it's a really efficient way to make nice straight edges. And when you get done, you end up with this pattern that if anyone's gone and looked at granites along the waterfront, you'll see lots and lots of this stuff. Those are the holes that were originally drilled to drive these little feather and wedge splitters to make these blocks before they hauled them and put them in place. So you can recognize the sort of time frame by the tool marks that you see on the granites. And some of the oldest granites, when they wanted to be a little bit more finished, they actually went and did careful chisel work and polishing with emery and things like that. So this is a very, very old sidewalk made out of Quincy granite that exists in East Boston, just up from the, just up the golden stairs from the, from the Harbor Walk. When granite became the thing, when they started using it in great abundance, people quickly discovered that hauling it by oxen from down in Quincy was a pain, painful operation, particularly the bigger blocks would sometimes take 40 or 50 oxen to haul. And these are some images from a book I'd highly recommend called Hammers and Stone by Barbara Erkela. Um, beautiful, beautiful pictures. They quickly discovered that up at Cape Ann, there were granites right on the beach, literally on the seacoast. And so they built Rockport and Gloucester and several other ports up there, Pigeon Cove, that became granite centers where they'd quarry it literally within a few hundred yards of the boats, just bring it down by wagon and drop it on boats and sail it down to Boston. So Cape Ann granite quickly became an alternative source to the Quincy granite from the south. And it turns out just because it was right at the water's edge, it was really cheap to ship by boat. And it was a lot more cheap than hauling by oxen. And then the world changed. Uh, the quarrying technology advanced. The Civil War happened. There was a decision to build a monument for the Bunker Hill battle. And there you can see a view of the Bunker Hill monument in the USS Constitution, looking at it across the harbor from the North End. Um, but to build the Bunker Hill Monument, when it was proposed, there was a developer who had just acquired the rights to this beautiful gray granite ledge in the Quincy area. And he convinced the legislators that they needed a really somber gray to build a, a memorial to the Bunker Hill. And so he got them to give him the contract to start quarrying this gray granite down in Quincy from the Quincy ledges. And of course, the the enormous amount of stone they needed, he set up an entire operation. And in fact, they built a three mile railroad as a horse drawn rail, rail cars to haul that granite down to the Neponset River and sail it up to Boston. And the three mile line came to the base of the hill and they built this thing called the Incline Plain, which is still there. This is a photo I took last year. Um, they actually had an interesting mechanism where there was a long cable and two cars that were on either side of this track. So as one went up, the other one would come down and there's a big pulley at the top. And so they'd load up the one at the top with a stone and they'd set it off with gravity and the brakeman would just slow it down as it went down the hill. And when it got to the bottom, the one that was now at the top, they'd load up with a stone and it would come down. So they'd go back and forth dropping these stones this way. And it turns out they decided that it would be better if they had some extra weight on the cars going up. So they had the clever idea of selling it as a tourist attraction. And they started selling penny seats on the cars going up, which added weight to the cars. So they didn't have to use as much braking, um, bringing the granites down. But that actually created, coincidentally, the very first paid, um, paid passenger railway in the United States was the inclined plane off of the Quincy Granite Rail Railway. Uh, unfortunately, it also has another nasty reputation in that about three years after they started, they had the cable snap and they had the first passenger fatality on a train in the United States. So a lot of railroad history goes along with the geologic history. But this is a site you can go visit today. They're ultimately trying to build a Quincy Granite series of sites for memorializing the history of granite in the Quincy area. Um, once you had the quarry and you had the infrastructure for delivering the stone to Boston, of course, you now had huge demand and, and they really went to town. And this is probably the most spectacular example of a Quincy granite building is the customs tower. At least the bottom part is made of Quincy granite. And the thing that's spectacular are these enormous columns that you see that run around the building. There are 36 of them. They're individually massive pieces of granite. They're 42 ton 
blocks. They're not segmented columns. That's all one piece of rock that was quarried. And they actually built a, a custom spinning mill, a turning mill, which is still preserved in ruins down in Quincy, where they literally turn these big long blocks and carve them. And it took a four man team about a month and a half to make each one of these. It's spectacular, spectacular. If you ever get a chance to go look at those and just marvel that that's a single piece of stone that they hauled all the way up here from Quincy, it's pretty spectacular. But that's a ruin. You can go see that if you go by the, the, the Granite Links golf course, but keep going up the road you run into the remains of the quarry mill, the, the turning mill that's there now. Another stone that came into play, I mentioned this Chels Chelmsford granite that came from up north. There was a canal that was built from Lowell where they were building mills to make cloth. They built a canal to deliver that cloth and some produce from the local farms down to the, the, the growing population of Boston. And shortly after the canal was built, the people in the nearby quarries of uh, Westford and Chelmsford decided, hey, we could send stone easily down the, the canal to Boston. And this became a very popular third variety of granite now to go with the Quincy and the Cape Ann granite. You're now getting Chelmsford granite. It's technically from a geology standpoint, not a granite. It's a granite nice. It's actually a metamorphic rock and it's got fabric. So if you go and you look at the Chelmsford granite pavers that exist on the Rose Greenway outside of the aquarium stop. You can see this incredible fabric that exists. These are actually sheared and, and deformed rocks. And it's fairly easy when you're walking around looking, trying to identify the rocks, these weird cable cuts that you'll sometimes see. This is a unique thing in the Chelmsford granite. They developed a steel cable wire, a little like the, the rope lift or the, the bunny slope uh, rope on a ski slope where they had metal rope that would be constantly fed with emery powder that would carve down and make these beautiful planar surfaces on the blocks. And it was actually more efficient than either the Chelmsford or the, excuse me, the Quincy or the Cape Ann. And so it became a very common building stone for things like sidewalks and and uh, and, si and sort of utility paving stone kind of things. It was never used much for actual buildings, but it was used for all kinds of utility work. And here's the quarry today. The Fletcher Quarry is the only remaining active quarry in Eastern Massachusetts. It's an enormous big hole in the ground that you can still go visit today. And in the middle of all this, when you've got all these different granites competing for the market, you can imagine that there was a, a free for all of trying to convince people that we're the cheapest, we're the best, we're worth the money, et cetera, et cetera. There were actually some tremendous, what I would call granite wars as they were uh, dissing one another and arguing that you know ours is better than theirs. And this is a, a 1925, I believe it was. Yeah, these are two ads from 1925 in the architectural record, giving you an idea of the lengths to which they would go to try and promote themselves over the other guy. Here's the Rockport Granite Company claiming they're the true Hornblende granite, which I won't go into detail why that's silly, but it is. Um, and here they're, exam they're, they're arguing that, you know, we were the choice to build the tower above the customs house. And we were the choice to build the Longfellow Bridge. And they're arguing the glories of their stone versus other people's stones. But that, that war went on for several decades until, until stone kind of fell out of favor in the, in the, the 1900s. After the Civil War, when the regional railroads developed, you started getting railroad transport, which was a lot cheaper than canals and boats. And you started getting rocks from much further away. And this is a very common one that started showing up in the Boston area, this Deer Island granite from coastal Maine. After the war, people were getting a little tired of these sort of somber gray buildings they had been building with the Quincy granite. And they decided they wanted something a little more colorful. And they discovered this sort of lilac colored stone and you'll see this if you go to the Museum of Fine Arts, the steps in the front of the Museum of Fine Arts are made of this, this stone. Or if you go to a lot of the, the subway stops, they've used this as a colorful stone for some of the subways around Boston. This is a, a footer of the, the Rose, Rose Wharf where we start the walking tour. This is the example, the first outdoor example I show of an actual rock on the Harbor Walk when we do the walking tour. So here they are, these are the three big ones. I taught people on the walking tour how to recognize these, but I think you can sort of see there are characteristics that are good to, to learn. The Quincy Cape Ann granites are very, very similar. So I wouldn't expect anyone who's not a geologist to be able to tell them apart, but they tend to be fairly uniform, medium grained, you know, little black specks. The typical granite 
the Chelmsford granite actually has fabric and has these big blotchy white feldspar. So it looks very different from the Quincy from the Quincy Cape Ann granites. And then of course the lavender color is a dead giveaway for the Deer Island granite. These are probably the three most common types of granite used in the Boston area. So you can quickly discover those and you get used to them. You start to recognize them almost instantly. Of course, there are a couple of other examples of famous stones that were used in the Boston area. I know I've got like no minutes left. Um, brownstones, everyone knows about brownstones. It's a famous building combination. These are some examples from around the, in, in East Boston near the Harbor Walk. You'd build brick buildings with these beautiful red sandstone lintels around the doors and the windows, Quincy granite markers and bases and stairs and iron from the Saugus Ironworks is a standard combination that people developed that uh, is very popular and is, is well known around the Boston area, all the way down to New York for that matter. And the last one I'm gonna look at is these Roxbury conglomerate churches. These are a famous thing when they filled in Back Bay, all of the migrants who were moving in wanted to build churches and they wanted to do it as cheaply as possible. And it turned out they were sitting on this mountain of Roxbury conglomerate here in Boston. So they learned how to quarry the harder parts of the Roxbury conglomerate and build these beautiful churches out of it. Here's a small one with rough stone. And here's a majestic one that was built out of more cleanly polished stone. You're literally standing here in the quarry looking over at the building that they made from that quarry. And this is as close as I could come to an actual Harbor Walk example from that. That's a, a couple of conglomerates used as a wall in East Boston right by the Harbor Walk. Cambridge Slate, that was very popular, but as you can see from this slide to the left, it doesn't hold up to New England weather very well. So uh, a lot of it does not survive and there are very few of them that are preserved today, but they were originally used for the mansard roofs and a lot of classic buildings. And then of course, last slide, the modern era is completely different. In 1926, the diamond saw was developed. And so at this point, you can make enormous slabs of one inch thick stone. And of course, the Eiffel Tower proved you could build tall iron structures. So all buildings from then on are now uh, iron and steel frames with just this thin cladding of rock on the outside. And if you look at this skyline view of Boston, you can see all the different colors of rock from all over the world, from Africa, from South America, from Asia, from uh, Europe that are now covering these buildings. So it's almost like a geologic tour of the world to walk around and look at the building stones. And of course, anyone who's uh, remodeled a kitchen and looked at stone countertops, you recognize the, the benefits of that sawing that now happens. You can walk around and literally see hundreds of rocks from around the world that you can use for countertops in your kitchens and bathrooms. So as a geologist, it's like a field day. It's a kid in a candy store kind of situation. So there's my closing slide. Um, beautiful slide, looking back at the city. I love this quote. This is from Lepresti Park in East Boston. A city is not an accident. That's a quote from a very famous uh, landscape arch uh, city architect named Leon Crier, um, who, who came up with that. But I think you would argue that there's a reason Boston is where it is, and there's a reason Boston looks the way it is. And a lot of it has to do with the geology that underlies the city. There it is. That's my talk. Scott, thank you so much. Knowing that we're bumping up against eight, I'm going to wrap up a couple things for people. Sure. Um, I want to let people know that if you are interested in being involved in the Friends of the Boston Harbor Walk in any way, you can go to bostonharbornow.org slash friends. So that's bostonharbornow.org where I work slash friends like Friends of the Harbor Walk. You can see past talks. This talk will be posted there um, and you can learn about the upcoming talks and webinars just like this one. Uh, when things are back to, I don't think normal, but when we are able to gather in large groups again, I'm sure there'll be live tours of the Harbor Walk as well, as well as cleanups. And you can always join up with the infamous Liz Nelson Weaver's sign team troopers. If you want to do historic research and build awesome signs, you can find out more about that there as well. For people who want to stick around, I see we've got some questions coming in through the Q&A feature. Um, we'll stick around and answer questions, so I'll dive into that. But if you need to hop off for your next eight o'clock Zoom or a late dinner, we wanted to give you a, a clear end, so. Yeah, I'm happy to hang around and answer questions if people have them. Awesome. Um, we have a lot of compliments. Let's just start with those. Um, Claire and Thomas and Todd all say thank you. It was an amazing talk. Really awesome presentation, says Sue. Um, Lori asks the question, in addition to saying, great talk, uh, do you have a favorite stone building on the Harbor Walk? 
I have to say that I just love the the beautiful columns of the custom house. I mean, I see the custom house from my back porch and at night looking at the little glowing clock on the customs house. It's just, it, I have a, a near and dear love for that building. It was the tallest building in, in Boston for 50 years until they built the Hancock Tower. It is a very special one. Um, Susan says, knowing all the geology and topology, why did they build on the seaport? Why did they build on the seaport? You're talking about South Boston, I assume? I think so. Um, I, I think it was a case that um, a lot of the areas where there's a lot of built land, it was essentially wasted area because there are big marshes and mud flats that were not very useful. And they found it a lot better to just plow gravel in there and make actual functional land out of it. And of course, they left the big indentations where the ships could come in and dock, but they expanded the land out just to put buildings there so that they could expand the city. I think it's just a natural desire to, to create more space for buildings and industry and people. Great. Um, everything else seems to just be lots of very hearty compliments from all sorts of people. One person yeah. says, I love Boston history, and this really reinforces that. So cool. Yeah. Um, well, I'm glad they liked it. Absolutely. Does anyone else have any questions? Feel free to pop them in the chat or the Q&A. Um, Oh, one final question. Are there any special features of Port Norfolk that you'd like to mention? Port Norfolk, uh, you'll have to remind me where that is. I'm not familiar with that term. I believe it's the part of Dorchester where the Neponset River begins to come out and there's that little peninsula south of Tenian Beach. Oh, okay, yeah, Kampala that Park. there's actually, as, as a geologist who likes actual outcrops, that area down near the Neponset River is actually quite spectacular and that you can see really nice exposures both in um, operations where they quarried out buildings so you have nice faces that have been preserved or the rocks or where railroads are driven through so you create exposures. Um, there's just some really good geology to see down there. And of course, when you get to the seacoast, you start to see some interesting geology, certainly from there south. Almost every place along the beach from there south has wonderful geology. So once you get into those hard rocks, they make beautiful seacoasts, get mm -hmm. sea stacks and, and rocky, rocky beaches. And our questioner says, yes, that's it. So please say as much as possible. You were great. Um, one other question was, where were the springs on Shalmet Peninsula and why did they happen there? Is there a geology to that? Probably no surprise. One of the springs is on Spring Street, which is why it got its name. Um, the reason they were there, the, there's actually been some geological analysis of that. It turns out that the mountain that is the Trimount, which became Tremont, obviously, for the modern uh, Anglicanization of it, but the three peaked bump that is Beacon Hill and the old, the other hills that have been taken away and used as land as, uh, to, to make new land. Um, those were there because the glaciers had retreated, but then came back a little bit before they finally retreated. And when they came back a little bit, they kind of crumpled up the geology in those drumlins. And it turns out that the geology is just perfect so that rainwater gets caught up in the sand layers between clay layers and builds up and then flows out near the base of the hill. And so it's a natural aquifer that captures rainwater and flows it out as freshwater springs. And there are about 13 places along the base of the hill, along essentially along the Long Wharf waterfront area, where that water would come out at the surface and people used it for drinking water. Excellent. But the, obviously the famous one is on Spring Street. It's not there anymore, but uh, that's one of the where one of the springs was located. Perfect. Thank you to everyone who joined us this evening, shared your questions, tuned in, hopefully learned a lot. I learned a lot. I had to res like stop saying the word wow out loud. <laughs> um, Scott, thank you. And thank you to everyone who came. We hope that you'll continue to follow the great work of the Friends of the Boston Harbor Walk. Well, with a little luck, a year from now, we'll be back out doing real, real walk and talk. And we can go actually put our hands on some rocks and do the real tour again. So look forward yeah. to it. And everyone in the audience, go go find some granite in your area and see if you can figure out what it's made of. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, no problem. Have a great night. Happy to do it. <laughs>